Well, good morning again. My name is Chad, one of the pastors here. It's a joy to be with you, uh, to spend time together. And I just want to say as we start, um, my heart this morning, actually this week, has been pounding. And just sometimes it seems so close. He seems so close. Eternity seems so real. And God gives us that on purpose. He wants you to feel the weight of eternity, wants you to look at the world around you, look at the people around you, and to say, this is reality. This is where we are. I know some of you uh, knew and loved Ron Haugen, uh, somebody who I served with for years on the worship team and got to listen to his beautiful Johnny Cash low voice. Um, amazing guitar player, served so many in so many places and so many churches, um, just a faithful man of God. And, and he is face to face with Jesus right now, right now. I know many of you came yesterday to celebrate his life, but that's, that feels intense to me. I went to Tennessee um, a couple weeks ago to be with my grandmother, who also is very close. And just to spend time with my mom and dad and with my grandmother and to, to sit together knowing it's close. Got to give her, serve her communion with my family. And there were lots of tears as we just felt the weight of Jesus and his gospel. And so if you are new or if your heart has felt a little cold lately or you felt distant, I have great news for you this morning. The Holy Spirit is not threatened by that. Jesus is able to give you understanding, give you awareness, give you perception. So as I pray, I want you to have the courage to say, okay, Lord, give it your best shot. My heart is definitely pretty struggling. It's in a struggling place today, or it's calloused, or I feel kind of cold, or I've been really caught up in all the stuff that's happening in our country, and just angry, and whatever it is, to be able to say, all right, Lord, open hands, open heart, Do your work. Do your work in me this morning. So let me pray for us together. Jesus, uh, what a beautiful name. What a beautiful name. The name that saves. The name above all names. The one that has no rival. And yet, Lord, we would say that our weekly maybe experience of, of attempting to walk with you, that potentially we have had some rivals to your name in our life this week. So God, we open our hands this morning as we read another story from your friend, John, the one who was close to you, who saw you, Lord, who knew what you looked like, could remember the freckles you had on your face, if you had any, knew the color of your eyes, the tone of your voice, the smile, maybe the one crooked tooth you had, who knows, Uh, Lord, but he was close. And, and he wants to, us to focus in again this morning. And so, Lord, as we open your word once again, would you move in powerful ways, Lord? Would you be working in our hearts, calling us? Lord, if, if you would have us to make a public profession of our faith today through baptism, Lord, would you be just gently stirring, stirring the waters of our soul? And we give this time and your, um, we give you honor, Lord. We give you praise this morning. Lord, we say we love you. But even if it's like with the tiniest voice and one that's just so frustrated, Lord, I, I say to you this morning, I love you. We love you, Jesus. Would you speak to us now in Christ's name? Amen. We're going to be in John chapter 12 uh, on page 898 in the Bibles that we provide under your chairs. Um, also can watch it on the screen uh, or look it up on your device. It's in our app But I want to jump right into the story. It is one that may be familiar to you. And for others, you may say, I've never heard this story in my life. Wouldn't that be cool too? So John chapter 12, verse 12. And uh, can't we say that the Lord was amazing in Carl Hansen last week? Yes? I want to give him. The Lord was amazing. Uh, I watched, uh, I, was, I was awake in Seattle and, and woke up to watch him speak. And my heart was stirred um, as Daniel slept next to me. <laughs> Isn't that weird? You go on trips, you got to share a hotel room, beds, and you're like, you stay over there and I'll stay over here. (laughs) 
So John chapter 12, verse 12, here we go. Now remember the story of Mary has just done this crazy, awesome thing and anointed Jesus with a year's worth of wages of perfume, okay? The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So Jesus found a donkey and sat on it. Just as, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Woo! -hoo! Here comes the king. His disciples did not understand these things at first. Well, yeah, nor do we. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. I bet they did. I bet they did. That guy's walking around. That dead guy's walking around. Did you see that guy dead? That's what it says here. That's, they're like there. They're like, ooh, 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 ooh. yes, yes, Jesus. Jim, Lazarus, right there, man. Awesome. He was dead, dead, dead. And you made him alive. So they're bearing witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. Wouldn't you go too? Wouldn't you go too? Wouldn't you find where that guy was that had been dead for four days and go up and be like, dude, can I touch you? <laughs> Wouldn't you? So that's what they're doing. They're following him around. The Pharisees aren't happy. They said to one another, you see, we're getting nothing. Just throw our hands up. Everything's hit the fan. Look, the world has gone after him. So Jesus is making an entrance into Jerusalem. Why? To die. To die. That is why he is headed back into Jerusalem. And I don't want you to forget the audience of this original book, this gospel, was to a church in Ephesus that John had started. And what were they feeling? Persecution. Why? Because they were choosing to follow Jesus. And they wanted to punt give up, tap out, press escape, reboot the system, not just a soft reset, a hard reset on your phone. You ever do that? It's like, I'm going to press both buttons. I'm so mad at you, iPhone. Like <laughs> they want to get rid of all the persecution, the hard stuff. So John is writing to them to say, hey, look at Jesus. Look at who he is. Anybody who loved Jesus at this time knew that this little trip was dangerous. Anybody who was close to him, they're walking in the streets and the disciples are watching all this stuff happen. They're like, yeah, this is great, Jesus. Woo. I mean, they're looking over their shoulders because they know imminent threat is coming. He will be taken. He will be arrested. What's going to happen to us? Let's just fast forward right now, that point right there. What should we expect for following Jesus in our time and culture? That the world would say, yay, Christians. Nope. We should sense imminent threat and danger as well. Now, sitting atop of this chapter, now we're going to contrast it right away. You get crowds raving stuff. They're like, yeah, Jesus. Sitting atop this chapter is what Carl talked about last week, where Mary has just busted this perfume. And if you've ever, like when I was a kid, I'm pretty sure I got into my mom's perfume. And you're like, this is awesome. This smells great. What happens when you just do like one too many squirts of perfume? You smell it everywhere. So as people are waving these branches, if you're close enough to Jesus, you can smell something. His body has been anointed. He is ready for death and burial. And if you get close, you'd be like, what? A Whoa, what is that? The dude on the donkey smells. <laughs> smells kind of nice. Donkeys don't usually smell so good. He smells kind of nice. What is that the smell of? Worship. What does your worship smell like this morning? That's what Mary's looked like. That's what sits at the top of this chapter and you contrast it to the crowds. Now, what is the whole deal with palm branches? And I remember as a kid and we do it too. We'd have the kids come in with palm branches. Hosanna, Hosanna. We sing the song and it's like, yeah. Palm branches 
were like waving a flag. And the flag of one country. Let me give you a little perspective. When the Jews went to war against the Romans, they printed money. And you know what was on the money? Palm branch. Because it was a sign of the rebellion. And so when they're waving these branches, though they are prophetically speaking for us that yes, he is the savior of the world, what are they really saying? Save us right now from these jerks, the Romans. You're our king. We want you to be king. We want you to crush them. Waving the breast right, dude. Oh, is right. <clears throat> hey, I love this kind of response right here. Awesome. Yes, waving the branches saying, crush them, Jesus. Now, does Jesus have a problem with patriotism? No, as long as for the right reasons, for the right causes. When there are things that line up in our country with his justice and his righteousness and his goodness, we should wave that flag. But there's only one situation where Jesus will allow you to wave a flag with him as the king. And it's when every flag is waving. And they're not really waving in like, yeah, us. They are bowing. That's the only way he will accept our flag. It is the only way he will accept our flag. Now, I know we are in a politically charged place right now. Tim Keller is a pastor that I trust and love. And he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times this past week. And he asked this question. Where does a Christian fit in the two-party system? You know what he said? They don't. Oh. Well, that's a little difficult, Jesus. I don't think I like that because, you know, I'm cheering for my side. And I bet our line, because it always does in this church, <clears throat> I bet the line between red and blue goes right down the middle of this church. Good. Good. Because Jesus would find the best things about both sides and he would applaud them. And then he would call out the things from both sides that would be wrong. Now, I am not, because I know I'm probably going to get some emails, probably going to get some walk-ups afterwards. It's okay. You do it. Come on. We'll fight. I've <laughs> been working on my jab cross. I can handle it. Just kidding. <laughs> but the point is, and here's what, here's what he said. If you find yourself taking only one side based on your tribe, your party, you just might be missing God's heart. Why did he grab a donkey? Why not a horse? Why not a war horse? Here comes the king. This is what they did. They came into the city. They're on horses and they're like conquering hero. So when the people are like, yes, save us now. Come on, Jesus. Do you see our flags that we're waving? He says, so, so. <laughs> and he grabs this. And just look at this, this right here. Doesn't that look so powerful? Yes. Go donkeys! Like nobody says that usually. Like it's not a team mascot for a reason. <laughs> but Jesus said, I am absolutely, and I'm stealing this from Dale Brenner, this great uh, guy who wrote a commentary. He said, he's the donkey king, which meant unless you accept me as a crucified king, you cannot have me. He was doing this on purpose. He was riding a donkey into town as they were trying to make a big political show about who he was and his power and how he's going to take over. And he was on their side. Obviously, he's on our side. And he said, I'm, I'm going straight against this. I'm going to ride this. And this is from Zechariah 9. The prophecy was there that says, behold, here's your king. And he's come riding on a donkey. Even if you read that, or if you heard that from Zechariah's mouth, you'd be like, king on a donkey. Well, I don't know. That doesn't seem so powerful. It says the disciples didn't know what was going on. And honestly, I don't think we do either. Now they wanted a king that they could say is our king. He's our powerful king. But honestly, so do we. We want a king that, that will do what we want. We don't like bowing, but we must accept him as the donkey king. 
And the Pharisees are flipping out and prophetically speaking, saying, look, oh my goodness, the world is going after him. And I think we could all say, hopefully, hopefully. Let's look at verse 20. Among those who went up to worship, they're in the crowd, at the feast were some Greeks, which is also just translated Gentiles, people who weren't Israelites. These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come. So this event, those guys coming up to ask to see him, prompted him to say, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And here's our memory verse for the week. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Is this possible? Is there any chance? At some point, a switch gets flipped in your heart and you're no longer okay with just hearing about him. You're no no longer okay about just seeing him from a distance. You want to be close and you say, I want to see him. I want to see Jesus. Jesus' willingness to meet with these guys is in contrast Don't don't those glasses bother you, people that wear them? You're like, I just want to clean those things. We need clarity to see him. Jesus' willingness to meet with these guys is in contrast to the Israelites who had segregated and said that certain races and certain people weren't allowed to get any closer. And God's original intent on that, on separating Israel, was so that they would be a blessing to the nations, not so that they would exclude the nations, but they decided, "Ah, not only are we going to be separate from the nations, we're going to say, you guys stink and you can't come here and worship. And so Jesus says, all right, definitely, I want to speak to them. I came for the world. Now, There's a cool little thing in there. These Greeks, these Gentiles came and they picked out two of the disciples to talk to, Philip and Andrew, both who had, ironically, Greek names. None of the other disciples did. So who would you go to? We want to talk to that guy. Ooh, there's an inn. They're like us. They have names like us. And let me just say this about you. There's somebody in your world, in your sphere of influence, who is going to meet Jesus because of you because of how you're made, because of the way you talk about him. He has specifically placed you on the earth, your personality, your DNA, the way you're wired to minister to people, to get them to respond. And the same way Philip and Andrew looked like guys that were safe to come to and that they could ask, they come to them to say, hey, can we see Jesus? Now they're request prompts him to say, game on. Now that Israel and the nations are represented, it is time for me to die. What does Jesus mean when he says, hate your life? seems like a weird phrase, doesn't it? Like if you went into a doctor, psychologist or something and said, yeah, I just hate my life. They would say, whoa, let's talk about that. Let's get to the bottom of that. That's not a good thing. What does he mean when he says, hate your life? Same guy, Dale Bremer, says there's such a good a thing as good hate. A person who dies to the supremacy of their own self-preservation and advancement at all costs. But this is the American dream, isn't it? Isn't it? I am looking out for number one. I have my rights. I want a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, Right? I need that. I want that. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. I'm not saying that our country isn't a great place. It is. But Jesus says, you need to hate that part. You need to put it in its place. You need to not look out for number one. John would write a letter later to the churches, and he would say it this way. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride of life, doesn't come from the Father. It comes from the world. And the world and its passions are passing away. Those who do the will of God will live forever. Jesus wants you to know he's better. He's better than anything in this life. 
He knows what you're made for, and he's willing to suffer for it. Let's look at verse 27 to see him beginning to suffer. Now is my soul troubled. Eugene Peterson says Jesus was saying, my soul is storm-tossed. I'm struggling. What should I say, though? Father, save me from this hour? No way. For this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice comes from heaven. I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said, it's just thunder. And somebody says, no, it's an angel that spoke to him. And Jesus answered, the voice was for you, not for me. It was for you so that you could hear his voice. Now is the judgment of the world. Wait a minute. Now is the judgment of this world? Now will the ruler of this world be cast out? And I, when I am lifted up, it is a picture of the cross, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him and they're like, what? We've, we've heard from the law that the Messiah, the Christ, is supposed to live forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who, who is the Son of Man? What kind of king is this? So Jesus said to them, because he didn't really answer, the light is among you for a little while longer. Clock is ticking. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe that you may become sons of light. Jesus is struggling and he's, his humanity is seeping through here. He's troubled. But what becomes the thing that he listens to? The Father's voice, he will obey. Why? You. For this purpose I came. What's another verse that tells us about God's purpose? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Now it says that whoever believes in him, but what it could say is that he gave his son to be judged for you, to have God's wrath poured out. I love to connect our deep emptiness and the ache that we have in this life with Jesus' troubled soul because he's the only one who can make it right. And his way to make it right is kind of interesting because he said, now is the judgment. Verse 31, now is the judgment. God loves us so much that he is judging us. Wait a minute. I thought the judgment was at the end of the world. What do you mean it's now? Isn't it, isn't it later? Like, don't we have time? Don't we have time to, to get ourselves right, to do things well? Isn't the judgment later? What Jesus is saying, and this was so great for my own heart to see this, is that yes, the realization of judgment and of your life and how it was lived and whether or not you had the righteousness of Christ will be realized when you die and when you face God. But when did it happen? 33 AD. Your life your sins, past, present, and future, the sins of the whole world placed on Jesus, Jesus, 33 AD. Why is the judgment then? Because God is pouring out his wrath. He's about to pour out his wrath on Jesus. And so our lives are defined, watershed moment, whether we like it or not, in that year. At the cross, I will be lifted up and in the same way that if you're charged with a crime and you're in a courtroom, the cross is the jury, it is the judge, it is the sentencing of humanity, and God himself will say, approach the bench. All rise. We will all rise. The question is, will it be now for you or will it be then? You will be drawn to the cross of Jesus no matter what, because judgment is happened then. And so when they freak out and say, how could you say this? I don't understand. Jesus doesn't really answer who the son of man is. He doesn't give them like a nice little theological talk on why suffering is important. He just says, you're running out of time. Believe now. Believe now. Let's finish the passage. Well, the second half of verse 36. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself, hid himself. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still didn't believe him so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. 
Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes. Wait a minute. He did this and hardened their heart? Because if he didn't, they might see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory, spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. And here it is. I want you to see these three words right here. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Keep it private. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. They love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And if anyone hears my words, doesn't keep them, I don't judge him. And the reason the judgment was being put on Jesus, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So don't mix it up though. Because then listen to what he says next. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words does have a judge. And it's the words that I've spoken. He's receiving judgment, but his words to say you must come to him could eventually judge you if you reject him. I've not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me has given himself, has himself given me a commandment, what to say, what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So the part that I want you to notice in this passage, and it's a longer section, but I really believe in just reading the Word of God sometimes. I don't need to say anything past it. God's Word can do its work. But the part that I got hung up on was this. He hid. He was hiding from them. Is Jesus hiding from you? Why would he hide This is why I think, because they had what they needed. He had been sufficiently revealed to them. They had enough truth. And now at this point, it is just pure rejection. And so when he says he is blinding their hearts, he's referring back to Isaiah. God is not doing some crazy, like robotic, like, oh, you might believe, but eh, nope, too late. I'm keeping you from it. That is not what scripture means. What it means is he's giving you what you want. He gives you tons of time to respond to him over and over. There's so many stories that we've seen. People have been looking at him. And ultimately, at some point, if you just keep rejecting, Jesus will say, okay, have it your way. As I said a few weeks ago, C.S. Lewis talked about hell. Hell is the ultimate monument to human freedom. And nobody's there that doesn't want to be there. He just says, here, He gives them over. It's a Romans 1 kind of thing. He gives them over to what they truly want. Now, what should this do to us? We're going to finish here. For those of us that know Jesus, it should put a fire in our bellies to tell people about him, an urgency. And for those who do not know him, what is he saying to you today? Now, you have what you need. You know, deep down, yes, you have a few objections and things up here and you got all this stuff that's going on in culture and society and you want to punt just like everybody else, but you have what you need. And you may be saying, yeah, but I'm just so messy and ugly inside. I can't come to him. And I want to finish with this story. And then I'm going to invite you to consider publicly, just like Mary, not like the crowd, not like the Pharisees, the people who are afraid, but like Mary to publicly say, I love him. The foster parents, and Joshua Butler has a great book called The Pursuing God. He tells the story of a couple of foster parents, and they'd taken in this young girl who had been involved in the sex trade. She was very broken, very hurt, took a lot of time to let her know that they loved her, they cared for her, and she knew how to manipulate men, and so she immediately was drawn to the dad, and she would call him dad, but she hated the mom. She knew she would never say mom. And so after six months of parenting and trying to help her, they finally get a night out. Somebody had provided a way, said, we'll stay with her. You guys go out. They went out, they came back and the person said, oh, it went great. Everything was fine. So they walk upstairs and the husband walks into the bathroom. He opens the door and he shuts it. And he says, don't go in there. Don't go in there. And she's like, let me in. Let me in. He's like, no, just, he, he saw something written on the mirror in red lipstick 
and he wanted to wipe it away before his wife saw it because too ugly, too messy. She pushed her way through and it said, and just think of the worst four letter word you can think, bleep you, mom, bleep you, mom, bleep you, mom. So he's just so like, oh my gosh, this is, the, this is awful. And his wife is crying and laughing. She's like, what in the world? How could you be laughing? And she says, she called me mom. <laughs> Jesus, when he looks at you, and if you think I'm too messy, there's too much junk here, I have too many questions, I can't. And you're like, I gotta get this all wiped off first. Jesus says, come on, come in the door open it, walk through into the light. That's what he's telling these people. Now's the time. Now's the time. I promise you, no matter how ugly you think it is, and even if you're at a really tiny place of faith, he will say, they called me dad. They called me dad. I'm going to invite Logan and the team to come on up. So here's the deal. We're going to worship for the rest of the time. And there is no pressure. I promise. If we just finish with a few songs, then we'll finish with a few songs. It'll be great. And we'll celebrate the two people that, the three people that came up earlier to profess their faith in Jesus. But, but if you're thinking, man, my heart is kind of stirred, but I'm not really ready today because, you know, I'm wearing my Sunday clothes. We have that handle for you. We have like a whole table of clothes and hair products and even like underwear and stuff, like all kinds of stuff, okay? Like there's no excuses. There's people to help you. The main thing is obedience to Jesus. There's going to be some people standing in the back. Pastor Daniel, some of our elders and board members are back there. And it's the first stop for you. If you come back and it's just to say, here's what I think this is and what I want to do. I want to, I want to publicly profess. And so as worship is happening, you just walk back there, you talk to them, and they'll lead you back to get changed. And you'll jump into that warm bath and publicly say, here's my broken jar of worship, Jesus. And he will say, she called me dad. He called me dad. That's, that's who our God is. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned at the stories, Lord, that I've been hearing my whole life. And I'm just seeing a, a new side, Lord, a new wonderful way about you. Um, such purpose, so determined. Lord, so committed to loving us. So God, as we worship, no pressure from any human being in this room is appropriate. What is very wanted is for you, Jesus, to move throughout the room, to put your hands on someone's shoulders and to say, today, you have what you need. So God, we give ourselves to you in worship now. We bless you. Christ's name. So just a clarification again, if you are sensing that, just head back to the corner there. There'll be some people to talk to you and, and we'll take it from there. Why don't we stand as we worship?